guys. Welcome back to the Moving Pictures Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Holtzclaw, and today we are going to discuss Hollywood cinema in the 1950s and 60s through the lens of two films, Bonnie and Clyde and Rebel Without a Cause. I'm really excited about this episode because I get to nerd out on the film history, um, and I'm really excited for you guys to, to hear it. I did a lot of research, and I used my old film textbooks. So, Rebel Without a Cause was released in 1955. It's directed by Nicholas Ray, distributed by Warner Bros. Screenplay is by Stuart Stern and Iving Shulman. Music by Leonard Rosenman. Cinematography by Ernest Haller. Edited by William H. Ziegler. And the running time is 111 minutes. The budget was $1.5 million, and it made $4.5 million in the box office. It stars James Dean, Natalie Wood, Sal Mineo, Jim Backus, Ann Doran, Corey Allen, and William Hopper. So the summary of this film is, after moving to a new town, troublemaker teen Jim Stark, who's played by James Dean, is supposed to have a clean slate, although being the new kid in town brings its own problems. While searching for some stability, Stark forms a bond with a disturbed classmate, Plato, Sal Mineo, and falls for local girl Judy, Natalie Wood, However, Judy is the girlfriend of neighborhood tough Buzz, played by Corey Allen. When Buzz violently confronts Jim and challenges him to a drag race, the new kid's real trouble begins. Whew! Okay. We are going to do a deep dive into that film. But first, I want to give the details of Bonnie and Clyde as well. They go very hand in hand, um, but they are from, they're about 12 years apart. So, stick with me. Bonnie and Clyde was released in 1967, directed by Arthur Penn, distributed by Warner Bros. and Seven Arts, which was an entertainment company active from 1967 to 1969. Screenplay is by David Newman, Robert Benton, produced by Warren Beatty. Cinematography by Brunette Gouffet, edited by Dee Dee Allen, music by Charles Strauss, and the running time was also 111 minutes. The budget was $2.5 million, and in the box office, it made $70 million. Um, it stars Warren Beatty, who plays Clyde, Faye Dunaway, who plays Bonnie, Michael J. Pollard, who plays C.W. Moss, Gene Hackman, who plays Buck Barrow, Estelle Parsons, who plays Blanchett Barrow, Denver Pyle, who plays Frank Horner, Deb Taylor, who plays Ivan Moss, Evans Evans, who plays Velma Davis, Gene Wilder, who plays Eugene Grizzard. The summary is, small-time crook Clyde Barrow, Warren Beatty, tries to steal a car and winds up with its owner's daughter, dissatisfied small-town girl Bonnie Parker, Faye Dunaway. Their crimes quickly spiral from petty theft to bank robbery, but tensions between the couple and the other members of their gang, hapless driver C.W., who's played by Michael J. Pollard, Clyde's suave older brother Buck, Gene Hackman, and Buck's wife, Blanchett, Estelle Parsons, could destroy them all. Okay, so let's just start with film in the 1950s. So I want to set a scene for you guys, um, specifically for Rebel Without a Cause. But this is really the start of a lot of things. This is a big historical transition in film, starting with the 1950s. So this is kind of when the idea of Teenage Rebellion became popular, and that really started in 1953 with Marlon Brando's The Wild One. This just really started a theme of films about rebellious teenagers, rebellious youth, um, teenagers just kind of being a nuisance, being a hassle. And depending on what movie you really look into, a lot of times the, the teenagers, the rebellion, the revolt is really glorified. And that's you know, kind of the takeaway for teen audiences is that's how you should act. That's the cool thing to do. That was the trend to be this rebellious teenager. This decade, the 1950s, is labeled the birth of the modern teenager, says Alex Bauer from Cine Nation. And the film distribution model in the 50s is is very telling for kind of how these how these rebellious teen movies are going to kind of come about and become the new blockbuster. You guys, I am so tired today. I just, I, I can't talk. I can't think. Um, I need more coffee, apparently. So just bear with me for this episode. 
I'm just drinking some coffee. Hold on. So this film distribution model leading up to the 50s and in the beginning of the 50s, teenagers were in B films. So, you know, there's an A plot and a B plot. A films, B films. B films are secondary. They were the low budget commercial films. And B films were like a second half of a double feature. So if you, you know, in the 50s, if you ever wanted to go to a drive-in, there were typically double features there. So you would see one movie and then the next movie would start. The next movie wasn't as important and wasn't as advertised. So most of the, you know, say posters for this A film would have, you know, double feature on it. And then it would say with B film. So it really was marketing the A film and then with the addition of the B film. You know, you got two films for the price of one. So it was this great deal and it was double features in this time are really popular. But again, a lot of times people didn't care so much about the second film. You know, you go and see your one hour, 111 minute film. There wasn't full interest in seeing the other one, seeing the B, the B film, if that makes sense. So here, the teen characters were really generic. Um, they weren't super interesting. They weren't really um, this pull, and they definitely weren't a movement um, up until about 53. So up until that time, teens were just there. They were just kind of characters. Nothing to write home about. So the goal here, specifically with Rebel Without Cause, was to draw in teen audiences by making teen characters more interesting, making them more, um, you know, A characters, and also making these B films into their own films. So instead of, you know, being the side character of a double feature, they were the main act. So, you know, so in 1955 with Rebel Without a Cause, this shifted. Warner Bros. bought the rights to the movie in the mid-1940s when it first started, um, the idea kind of came about, because they liked the original title, which was Rebel Without a Cause, colon, The Hypoanalysis of a Criminal Psychopath. This was James Dean's second feature, and when he joined and production started, Warner Bros. decided to turn it into an A film that was colorized, and shot with Cinemascope, which was brand new film stock. So at this point, Warner Bros. was really investing in the film. They were saying, we got James Dean. You know, I like the title. I like the concept of the film. We're going to go out on a ledge here and make it its own A film. Um, it's going to be colorized as well, which expensive. And it's going to be shot in Cinemascope. So we're also going to take a chance on this new film stock and shoot the entire thing, which I can't imagine wasn't, you know, expensive. So all that to say, I think James Dean really solidified what this film was going to be. And then, of course, when Natalie Wood joined, she was a child actor. And she actually almost didn't get the part because the director didn't think that she was rebel material, that she was, you know, super rebellious, that she was going to be this icon of, you know, what a teen is and this new kind of revolt youth culture world and what's funny is that she actually got into a, a minor accident on set and when she was hospitalized she overheard some of the nurses calling her a juvenile delinquent and delinquent delinquent am I saying that right so basically they insulted her and she calls up the director and is like they called me a delinquent I need to be in this movie look, look, they think I'm rebellious. They think I'm this rebellious teenager that, you know, was kind of disgusting to the older generation. I should be in the movie. So she got the part. So teens at this time were becoming wild, which is the entire focus of these films and kind of this new idea of what a teenager should be was wild. Um, you know, they were goofing off, they sneak out, they get heated or angry. And so I think the negative sides of being a teenager, in my opinion, but that was cool. And at this time, it makes sense um, if you just think about where the world was in the 1950s, it made sense that teenagers were going to go into more of a revolt mindset rather than a traditional stick to the status quo mindset. 
So to have Hollywood really popularize and glorify this negative stereotype of a teenager, but then tell you that it's cool to do that, it makes sense why this kind of youth culture and subculture and in Hollywood, you know, took root in America. Another aspect to these films is that the, the teenagers' home lives are not good. Their parents are not supportive. There's just kind of turmoil. They don't, the parents don't understand the teen. And I think that also created a lot of divide between generations in general because it did become this youth subculture of kids are cool, parents are out. And then the parents are obviously disapproving of this rebellious behavior. And so it just kind of divided the generations even more significantly than I think, you know, just kind of happens generally um, because of the age gap that's there. I think, I think at this time, the media just really wanted to turn attention towards teenagers. And that's what the focus of these movies were. So here, all of this art is really imitating life and it gave power to teens in real life starting in the 50s and moving towards, you know, the 60s and continuing through the 70s and beyond. So moving into the 60s, the major studios at the time were MGM, Warner Bros, United Artists, Universal, Disney, 20th Century Fox, and Columbia. Now, all of these big studios really controlled distribution. Almost any film worth money was brought through these these studios and if none of them wanted it then it would go to an independent studio which were just a few so although there were different studios and stars celebrities didn't sign on specifically with studios they were still in power and a lot a lot of big stars signed long-term contracts with these studios so that gave them a lot of clout and a lot of power in making these blockbuster films that would actually do well. So although technically, you know, it's not like these studios were running the world, they were running Hollywood. Although technically there were other films being made and making money, these studios were still really ruling Hollywood. So this is when Movie Brats started coming up. And this is actually my favorite fun fact. If anyone asks me, you know, what's a fun fact about film, this is the one I go to. So these move, quote unquote movie brats were filmmakers. They were up and coming, usually younger, 20s and 30s. Um, some went to film school, but some really just turned away from that notion that you have to be educated in film to create film. And so that was new. And then to have some of them growing up in Hollywood, they already had those connections. They already had that, that advantage. And so a lot of them just didn't need school. A lot of them decided to go to school, but, you know, still had that kind of privilege to their name because they did grow up in Hollywood. And these were kind of the teens grown up into young adults that were influenced by Hollywood and the new youth culture. So a lot of older generation of filmmakers didn't like this, that there were younger people coming in to take their place, but it really was innovative. And some of the most well-known filmmakers are considered movie brats. And, you know, just to list a few, Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, Steven Spielberg, Brian De Palma, and George Lucas. If you at all know anything about film, you know these names. And so that says a lot about this new idea of younger people coming in and making their mark. It really stood out in, in the 1960s and 70s going forward. Film innovators from the silent era, these older generation filmmakers were no longer at the forefront. They were retired. They were just out of work. Some of them were not alive anymore. That kind of thing. And so they needed some people to come in and take their place and it just really shifted the whole culture of Hollywood. John Ford, after completing his final feature, Seven Women, um, that was released in 1965, he said, Hollywood now is run by Wall Street and Madison Avenue who demands sex and violence. This is against my conscience and religion. So like I said, some people weren't happy about this, but this change was also happening in relation to movies like Rebel Without a Cause and Bonnie and Clyde that really changed the content that was being produced. 
the content of movies, the the meat of the story was changing. And they were talking about progressive ideas and scandalous ideas. And it was all really, really changing film in general. You know, what was being released, what was being consumed, what was being encouraged, what was being glorified, etc. Also, I just want to note some examples of these films that Movie Brats made are the following. Let me know if you've ever heard of them. The Godfather, American Graffiti, Jaws, Taxi Driver, Carrie, and Star Wars. Also a fun fact that I do like to say, anyone who acted in the film Brat films were considered part of the Brat Pack. And I don't know why, but I love that nickname. I would love to be considered the Brat Pack. I feel like that's so cool. And I'm sure many people looked down on the Brat Pack because they were looking down on the movie Brats. But it just to just to show you how notable it was, the people that were in the, the movie Brat films were also labeled, you know, as, as movie Brats in a, in a way. So kind of like I've been saying, this, this youth culture and the subculture was kind of becoming really notable as teen picks, youth picks, counterculture films. Those were kind of the, the names that they were being coined as because they all became so popularized with the younger generation in power. And so because of this, you know, like, I guess I already said this, but because of the Hollywood display of youth in power, that kind of translated to real life where youth kind of started taking control. And again, art imitating life, life imitating art, you know, there was big clash of authority energy in these films. And this was really brought on by post-war civil rights movements and just kind of all these micro politics that were going on regarding the war and and the aftermath and everyone just kind of trying to find their their footing i think this was a really good time for film to shape society and it did so although there was also a lot of success in the 1960s there was also a lot of crisis specifically in the hollywood system so movie attendance was continually dropping they kept thinking it would pick back up. These executives were just really, really hopeful. These studios were hopeful. But it really struggled about until the end of the 1960s. So studios were losing money. They were being forced by banks to trim the number of releases and partner with other studios for co-production films to try and generate more profit. And an example of this like co-production is when Warner and Fox joined forces for The Towering Inferno in 1974, which was a popular movie. So, you know, it, it kind of worked. I think the different angles that they took, some were successful, some were, some were not. But still, even with this subculture that was created, the studios were unsure of what the public wanted until more of the B films were turned into A films. So until those double features kind of became their own features, that's when, you know, they weren't really making that much of a profit. And I think they just didn't, the studio system just really didn't have a really good business model for the times. And so they were just kind of flailing. And until a few low budget films yielded results, then they, they didn't really know what was happening. But once this happened, um, one of the low-budget films yielding results was Bonnie and Clyde and The Graduate, which I have talked about in season one, so go listen to that if you um, haven't. So a lot of these low-budget films that became popular were just really independent studios trying to make films and make money, but it wasn't coming from the studio system of we have to keep Hollywood alive. It was more so like let's create art. And so... I think the reason that they were so popular is because they were different and they weren't these blockbusters. They weren't these double features. They weren't the typical things that that you would be seeing all the time because a few films were getting it right. Kind of in the mid 60s, the entire classical studio style of films began to change. So it felt like Hollywood was finally realizing what the public wanted and what worked. And so now they're shifting every model that they have to suit that fit for for cinema. So Hollywood started catering to the youth more and more. 
um, they started trying to woo teen audiences. So they really, really honed in on the niche of teen audiences, trying to get them to bring up attendance, to, you know, help make profit, to go and consume these films. And they reinvented the blockbuster film with this youth culture in mind. So some of the changes are foreign films became popular. For example, Hercules, 1969, Zorba the Greek in 1965, and Alfie, 1966. Location filming was more common. So even within cramped bars and apartments or rooms, spaces in general, they also used long focal length lenses to add to these small spaces because it enlarged these small areas and was safer in urban areas for the cameramen. And so small spaces but long focal length also gave this new feel to a film just based on the location. And if you think about The Graduate, they use a lot of small enclosed rooms and you really get the claustrophobic feel of the main character and it it adds to it. It really, really creates the story. And so I thought that was cool that there was, you know, kind of a reason to it. Um, it flattened the shot space and produced soft, blurry contours. Bonnie and Clyde in the end scene, the end shooting scene, is a really notable example of this. Um, I found it multiple times in textbooks that they they really, really wanted to produce this soft image to kind of juxtapose the violence that was happening. And in my opinion, that was very successful. So long lenses were almost always used for most medium shots and close views. Um, they also used discontinued shots, so they didn't always need kind of this running understanding of this scene then goes into this scene and goes into this scene because they walked across the street or because they got in the car and then we go to the car scene it kind of became more understood that you didn't need to shoot every little space in between scenes and as long as it's still understood that they got in the car and now they're halfway on down the highway then it made sense and it was still coherent enough for you not to have to add every second into the movie um, faster and flashier editing um, and just really accelerated pace of the film entirely was new um, and becoming very popular. So, for example, editing in Richard Lester's A Hard Day's Night in 1964 and Help in 1965 are really good examples of this flashier editing, this quick pace. Another example, Robert Aldridge, The Dirty Dozen in 1967 average 3.5 seconds per shot which is really short if you look at films that came before it it's a different feel and i think it it does feel more modern as everything we consume now is much quicker i think we have a lower attention span now so all of that was was really really innovative at the time lester also in invented another trend um wordless scenes so like montage sequences, pop songs in the back, less dialogue, more music, and just kind of having music overlay a scene was really uncommon until Lester kind of invented this new trend that a bunch of movies started using. A really good example is Simon and Garfunkel in The Graduate in 1967. You don't hear anything except the music and you just get to feel the emotion of <laughs> Ben and it, it sends a message without having to say it. And I think it's a really good trend that obviously we still use today. Introduction of full-length songs into scenes became a staple of American cinema. And now, around, you know, mid 1960s late 1960s, film studios were becoming affiliated with music companies and saw the benefit of cross-plugging movies and recordings. And this is where soundtracks come from. People started joining, signing on to movie studios to make music for movies. And so that's where we get our soundtracks. For example, Elvis was with MGM. So during this time, a lot of MGM films had Elvis songs in them. And these soundtracks became a big source of profit. And this kind of starts like the whole idea of, of a movie franchise. So there's merchandise, there's soundtracks, there's films, there's DVDs, there, you know, all of the things that I think of with a classic blockbuster film is what was starting to happen and this was kind of being invented in the 1960s. And so Lester's techniques were also applied to volatile content by Arthur Penn in Bonnie and Clyde. So the average shot length for Bonnie and Clyde was less than four seconds 
and it was really popularized by the use of slow motion to render extreme violence. So you can see this all throughout Bonnie and Clyde, um, specifically the end shooting scene, which is also the climax of the film. They use a lot of slow motion to really hone in on the violence and hone in on this person that's dying or being shot at or, you know, flailing out of the cart, etc. This is what I heard referred to as spasmatic dance through rhythmic slow motion. And I feel like that's just perfect for Bonnie and Clyde. Um, <laughs> so then after Bonnie and Clyde, fast cutting and slow motion really became standard ways of presenting violent action. So this was trend setting in the making. Um, and this film really, really, really changed what film looked like. Kind of all over, but you know, in this instance specifically for, for post-production. But I also really want to describe to you guys this rating system because with Bonnie and Clyde specifically, it's so memorable because of the content, because of this violence, the sex, the just kind of outrageous for the time depiction of those things, of these taboo things. You didn't, you didn't watch someone actually die in films. You just knew that a gun went off and then he was just dead. And you didn't actually watch people have sex. For for many years in cinema, a married couple could not sleep in the same bed on TV or in movies. They had to have separate single beds. And that changed. And a lot of this Bonnie and Clyde content and the the taboo subjects that were in it were not allowed. And so to have Arthur Penn actually produce this film that was so against what the standard guidelines for film was in and of itself was very very impactful to society to see someone just you know say screw it I'm gonna have this movie released I'm gonna make this movie I'm gonna release it and then for it to do well was also really really kind of iconic for film history I, I in my opinion the rating system started in the 1930s. It was um, with the Hayes Code when films started getting racier and every film was not fit for every audience. So there had to be a production code seal on each film release. This was really only between 1934 and 1968 before it changed. But due to the bias for films protected with the seal and then films rejected of the seal, the code was really falling apart by the 1960s. There were some films that were being given the stamp of approval that had nudity in them, and there were some films that were perfectly normal and were being rejected and then, you know, getting kind of blacklisted and just basically getting thrown away. And so with all of that, people just started releasing their films. Like I said with Arthur Penn, they just started releasing it, saying, I don't need the code, I'm not going to pay attention, I'm going to break guidelines, and I'm going to release my film independently. So... In 1966, films that failed to conform to MPAA, which is the Motion Picture Association of America, films that failed to conform to MPAA guidelines were labeled as suggested for mature audiences. And then this is what started the code system, aka the rating system. So in the 19 starting in 1966, these were the ratings. G for general, recommended for all ages. M for mature, recommended for viewers over 16. R for restricted, viewers under 16 to be accompanied by parent or guardian. And X, no one under 16 permitted. So this translates to today's rating system. Obviously there are a lot of steps in between the 1960s and now, which I can talk about on another day. But today, here are the ratings, if you didn't know. G for general audiences, all ages, PG, Parental guidance suggested some material may not be suitable for children. PG-13, parents strongly cautioned some material may be inappropriate for children under 13. R for restricted, under 17 requires accompanying parent or adult guardian. So now it's 17, not 16. And NC-17, adults only, no one under 17 admitted. The specific impact of Rebel Without a Cause I think I've really hit on already because it really defined the decade. Like I've said, you know, it's 
this massive hit with younger audiences and then not so big hit with adult audiences and older generations, this youth culture was started with this film. So the whole youth culture that I've been talking about in the 1950s was because of Rebel Without a Cause, almost entirely. So, you know, just again, this film really helped to solidify youth culture as a separate identity within the American culture of the 1950s. And it was just kind of a subculture with its own rules. And kids ruled the world at this point. What's really interesting is that I saw a critic review by Emmanuel Evie, and he said, while Rebel created youth culture, it also suggests the impeding demise of that culture. Youth must end as one must grow old. And I felt like that really hit the spot where, you know, this youth culture was created, but it was also this sudden movement of kind of live while you're young and I feel like that's the whole rebellious nature that is coming out in these films is like they just get to enjoy their childhood and here it, that kind of you know speaks to why kids felt like they had leeway to revolt while they were young because they just get to enjoy that time and have that time which I thought was interesting I don't know maybe just something to think about so with Bonnie and Clyde, I also have already hit on this a little bit, is that they just really had a new and risque approach to sex, violence, and even gender at the time that no one had seen before. So although that ruffled some feathers, it was also really eye-opening to Hollywood and to America in general about what kind of film they wanted to see and what kind of films they enjoyed. It really is piggybacking off of the rebellious youth and this idea of revolting and it kind of turned into this more dense idea of violent and dangerous youth. So yes, this film is a biopic of the real Bonnie and Clyde, but I think more than that, it was really just solidifying that there's so much more to youth and that included the danger and the the scandals and the, the sex and the violence and the shooting and the crime. And it just brought this whole new perspective to to this, this subculture idea that we had already established. And, you know, because of the shattering of the, these old film conventions and ideas, this film is universally regarded as the first film of the new Hollywood era. This film paved the way for more liberal films and a more progressive classification system in film in the U.S. And again, this is when the film system started, which is also another fun fact that I think it's really interesting how we can progress all the way from this production code seal with the Hayes administration all the way to what we have today. Um, I was also thinking, just as a side note, I really miss going to Blockbuster and picking out a movie or like five. I mean, I would probably get like five Mary Kate and Ashley movies all at the same time because my mom knew I would watch them in like a day. So she would get five at a time. I mean, it was just, it was so amazing just to like go in and just spend time going up and down the aisles looking at movies. Ugh, so good. And then you and your siblings had to fight about which one you wanted and you'd have to compromise and you'd have to say, okay, this one now, next week we'll get this one. I mean, wow, bring me back. So anyway, um, so just some some critic reviews of this film is that Roger Ebert in September 25th, 1967, who actually really praised the film Bonnie and Clyde, um, says it is pitilessly cruel, filled with sympathy, nauseating, funny, heartbreaking, and astonishingly beautiful. If it does not seem that those words should be strung together, perhaps that is because movies do not very often reflect the full range of human life. So he thought that this this new idea of bringing in sex and violence and, and crime and risque relationships brought more of a full human experience into cinema. And I have to agree. I would have to say that limiting films to only certain circumstances is not real art imitating life. That's not how life is, you know? And so I think maybe that's why I like these really realistic modern films. You know, like I talked about with I, Tanya, it felt really, really raw and real, and I really appreciated that. So I'm wondering if maybe that's why I like modern movies better, because it feels more realistic, more accurate to the life that I live in, the generation, the society, that kind of thing. 
Another reason why it was so impactful is that audiences actually got to see people die and suffer. And I already hit on this a little bit, but as Herbert says in Bonnie and Clyde, real people die. Before they die, they suffer horribly. Before they suffer, they laugh and play checkers and make love or try to. These become people we know. And when they die, it is not at all pleasant to be in the audience. And so that's kind of the realism. It's just not super slapstick for people to die anymore. And, you know, before this time it was, it was, it was kind of a joke. It was, you know, just a little sound effect of a gun and it didn't sound realistic. So he goes on to say, perhaps at this time, it is useful to be reminded that bullets really do tear skin and bone and that they do not make nice round little holes. I agree with him. I really agree with him. And I did like this movie. I think it was, it was a lot and it, it did have still some old themes that you never see in modern cinema anymore. But I did really like, you know, knowing all of this information, I liked watching this new material. I liked watching what the violence isn't really violence considering what we watch now. But seeing that, knowing that at the time that was really risque and really taboo and really different, I think it impacted the film and I think it, it made it a lot more enjoyable to watch. So... Again, there, you know, those were the good critic reviews, but I know that a lot, a lot of people hated this film. Um, a lot of people considered it an empty project, an embarrassment, not anything worth watching, a waste of time, etc. For example, critic Bosley Crower said, It is a cheap piece of bald-faced slapstick comedy that treats the hideous depredations of the sleazy, moronic pair as though they were full of fun and frolic as the jazz A's Kutups in Thoroughly Modern Millie, which is a 1967 musical starring Julie Andrews, and it's considered another sound of music. So just picture really happy tap dancing, you know, walking down the streets feeling like a million bucks. So not a lot of people liked it, but a lot of people did. And the same goes with Rebel Without a Cause. A lot of the older generations are the ones that have problems with these films, which makes sense. And I think that just really marks the change in history is, is that this new generation was coming in. This new generation was changing the way that the systems worked, the studios worked, how the money was made, the topics of conversation, the audience attendance. They were changing what the world glorified, what the world encouraged, what the world thought about on a daily basis. And I think that these films are worth discussing because this giant history was so enwrapped in these films. And these films, you know, changed history. They changed the way that things worked. I had a lot of fun researching this episode. So I hope you guys liked it. And I know I didn't really talk that much about kind of the film making of these films, but I think the history really speaks for itself. But thank you guys so much for listening and thank you for letting me nerd out. Please like, subscribe, and review wherever you get your podcasts, and feel free to drop some thoughts on this episode on my website, www.themovingpicturespodcast.com, and if you go to episodes, you can listen there as well. I would love to answer any of your questions. Please follow me on Instagram and stay updated on my stories and my posts. I'll talk to you later. Bye! Now if you run into the fact that you covered with her Diamond rings and all those things Bless your life, it isn't her Could she love, could she 